right? <laughs> Think about these, these saints and us being among them. Paul makes that extraordinary claim right from the beginning of his letter to the Corinthians that you are called to be saints. And part of that is a revolutionary idea. Part of that is an extraordinary notion that these Gentiles from Corinth were also called to be saints. Saints in the Old Testament, uh, in the Greek version of the Old Testament, the word for it is hagioi. <clears throat> so when Leviticus, uh, God will say, you are to be holy for I, your God, am holy. And over and over in Leviticus, they are told, the people of God, the Hebrew people are told, you are to be holy. Hagioi. You are to be saints. You are to be holy. Because I'm holy. And so it's a little bit of a, a revolutionary claim that St. Paul would say, you Corinthians, up there in that wild city, that modern urban city with all its various gods and all its godlessness, you who didn't have any part of that original covenant that the Hebrew people had, the, the same people who were called to be holy in God's first testament, you, you also Gentiles up in Corinth, you are called to be saints. It's a pretty extraordinary claim he was making on their lives and, and somewhat of a, a, a surprise that he would, he would make that. It, it's as if location doesn't matter. But you don't have to be in Israel to be holy. It, it's as if religious background doesn't matter. You don't have to have been part of that original covenant with God to be a saint. It's as if none of that should make an influence on what's going forward. You, wherever you are, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, are called to be saints. We don't like that description. We resist sainthood. We, we think of that first common definition that, that goes around, that saints are extremely virtuous persons, and we, in all our humility, wouldn't dare claim that of ourselves. We are not extremely virtuous people. We don't want that said of us because we know it's not true. We know what we're really like. We're not that good. We look at some Gothic structure. We see those guys and we think they must be real saints. Those who've been carved in the stone or wood, those are the real saints. Clutching their Bible and then those have swords of faith, others might have a quill ready to write out God's next holy word to God's people. They're the real saints, not us, not you, not me. Honestly, the chances are pretty good we won't end up on a wall like that. Most of us won't get carved into Duke Chapel. They won't pull off somebody else and put us up there instead. Most of us just don't get that opportunity. And yet, Probably none of them anticipated being cut into stone either. If they were standing around posing for their sainthood statue, then they weren't deserving of it. If, if their purpose in life was to see if they could end up on a wall somewhere, then that's about as good as they were worth. God's calling us to be a saint in a statue. God's calling us to be a saint in real life, living it out. And not a saint for some other person's viewing but a saint for God's good work, a saint for God's church. So St. Paul wasn't telling us to have some kind of superhuman virtue, to, to elevate beyond what others are, are capable of, to get some kind of recognition for it. Paul is just saying simply, you are called to be saints, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, you have what you need to do what is faithful and right and good for the sake of the kingdom. You are set apart, just as those people back when Leviticus was given to you, them a long time ago who were set apart for the purpose of God. You are set apart for God's purpose. You have something special called and asked of you, and you can contribute it for the sake of the kingdom. You are meant to be set apart. Now in Corinthians letter, he'll go on to say some of what that means. He'll give some descriptions, and in his basic virtues, he'll say things like you should have no sexual immorality, you should have no greed, no idolatry, no drunkenness, no thieving. It's just, you know, acting like we know we are, as our mothers and fathers call us, we are. And then he'll, he'll turn around and he'll remind us of some specifics of caring for the poor among us. And that is part of what it means to be a saint, to care for the poor. He'll, he'll say that it means we are connected with other Christians beyond just those we sit around, that we aren't in this thing alone. 
And that gets back to what he starts out with. That you are called to be saints, along with those Christians who in every place, those people who follow Christ, you are connected with them wherever they are. Every person, all persons who claim this name. This is important for him to tell to the Corinthians because he knows what they've been up to. He knows they've been ranking each other. And one of the things the Corinthians do and, and have done and that he will chastise them for is that they've determined that for some reason speaking in tongues is a spiritually excellent gift and, and other gifts are not quite as good. And so he knows that one of their concerns in that faith community is that they have determined which, which gifts of the Spirit should be elevated. He knows also that they have joined in their uh, broader cultural uh, evaluation of, of the economy that they've decided that if you're richer you're more important than if you're poor. He knows that they are living out this by, by doing things like running to those who can get there the communion table and eating up that food before the poorer ones who haven't had a chance to get there can arrive. He knows they've been treating people in classes and he's not real pleased with that. So Paul is writing from the beginning to say hold on that's not what it means to be saints. Saints don't get to determine people's value based on their, their finances. Saints don't get to determine people's value on these spiritual gifts that you think are more important than others. And he'll have a long, good description of how each gift is necessary for the sake of the kingdom. And all persons are necessary for the sake of God's work. One of the things he reminds them is that, that they are tied to something bigger than the church in Corinth. That, that, being a Christian means you are part of something larger than just who you are uh, in one church. It's something United Methodists should sort of get. Um, we know that we can't do as much as an individual congregation as we are called to do as a denomination. We, we know it uh, logically. We should know it as part of just how we operate. We know that, that no United Methodist Church singly could fund a research hospital or a university. We know that very few United Methodist churches could have a lasting presence in a place of disaster or even set up a clinic that, that much uh, succeeded. We know that, that even something as local as the Bethlehem Center would not be as good if it were just a single church trying to make that thing happen. We, we kind of get that SMC can't operate on the back of St. James and Kansas. It, it needs more than that. The United States Church has figured out a way to, to say, you have a portion of this thing, and, and, and you have a portion of this thing, and, and together we'll put these, these funds together, we'll put these gifts together, and, and we'll make ministry happen on a bigger scale. Not many of us can arrive in the Philippines or Zimbabwe where some other saints are actively at work in ministry, but by being connected, our way of operating in this world, there is United Methodist presence in those places and many other places. We can't be everywhere as a church, as a denomination, we can be in a lot of places. And you, you hopefully have heard the word and know the value of it. We call it apportionments or apportion giving. It's, it's our our fair share portion of, of these ministry supports for across the world. Each church, each particular congregation has a, a percentage we're asked to be part of, knowing that it multiplies, that, that our contribution added with another contribution isn't just added, but multiplied and becomes a greater, a greater support. It's, it's part of who we are as United Methodists, and I think it's back to what St. Paul says we should be up to, which is realizing that we are part of ministry with all the saints, wherever they are. All the saints, all those who've been called into ministry for whatever purpose, for the sake of God. And it's also part of how we reach out to those who need the ministry of the saints. How we express our concern everywhere. So it's not, um, it, it, it's been a bother to a lot of us here at St. James that we haven't quite reached our 100% in a while. Um, we haven't fully funded our portion of the abortions in several years. And it's remained on the council's agenda and remains a concern and is uh, discussed regularly. And it is our good goal 
that one day soon we will get back up to 100% proportions. We have a process in place to try to get there. Um, and I'm grateful that we found some ways to improve. We, we've done things like the Fall Festival, where every single penny that is earned goes straight into supporting the mission portion of our portions. And those cans are in here, these baskets, whenever you put a dollar or a coin in there, it goes directly to paying our portions, the missions and our portions. The, the mission tree that we have in Advent is the support of, of our relationship and ministry across the world. Of course, Paul doesn't say it's just economy, right? It's not just finances. Just as no one church could do all the work that we're called to do in this world, no single person can do all the work he or she uh, is, or that God needs out of all of us. And, and so spiritual gifts aren't just located in one person. That's why he, he was so concerned that, that they would lift up the one who could speak in tongues as somehow morally or, or spiritually significant, more significant than others because he would say, it can't be just one person. That, that, that each of us have a spiritual gift within us that we are called to express for the sake of the kingdom. And, and just like the other gifts, that if we don't, Acknowledge if we don't celebrate, if we don't utilize the gifts that are in each one of us, that we have somehow shortchanged the kingdom of God. We have backed off of what God is calling us as a body to do. And so each of us has a contribution to make for the sake of the kingdom. He goes on to say that, that you are not lacking. You, church in Corinth, are not lacking in any spiritual gift. And he says, with God's strength, you may be blameless, blameless, on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the grace of God is sufficient. Those people living in that morally questionable city, in that place with all kinds of influences that are creeping into the church, where they are living in some ways more like Corinthians than like Christians, those very people, he says, have, by the grace of God, what they need to be blameless, to be holy, to be saints. They have what they need by the Holy Spirit to do what God calls them to do. They live in a place known for wild living. They live in a place that has had corrupting influence on some of the members of the church. They live in a place that that challenges some of the very things Paul holds dear. There are pages where he will criticize some of the ways they've been living. Pages of them. And yet they are not lacking in any spiritual gift necessary. But I think that means is there's no excuse. That they can't point to their morally bankrupt city and say, you've prevented my sainthood. That they can't look at God and say, you didn't give me what I needed for sainthood. They can't point around to any other person and say, because of you, I am not a saint. They have to own it. Their calling is to be saints and God has given them what they need to do that. At the same time, they can't prevent that theirs is not a... They can't claim that theirs is not a high calling. That they can't say that there's nothing significant about this calling to be saints. That, that, that somehow it's not the challenge of their life and the gift of their life to be saints, to be holy, to be set apart for the sake of the kingdom. They can't, they can't back away from that. Paul, I think, would, would endorse what the Westminster Dictionary of Theological Terms has used to define saint. It doesn't spend a lot of time with this, this vir uh, virtuous person, this canonized person, these people we would carve into walls. What it turns around and says is all members of churches who are Christians are consecrated to God through Jesus Christ. All. Everyone. Consecrated to God 